Good morning and welcome to this edition of San Diego People. I'm Lauren Finney. As you likely know, February is Black History Month. However, you may not know much about San Diego's black history. Here with me to discuss the legacy of black history in San Diego is Yvette Porter Moore from Root Digger Genealogy Research. Good morning, Yvette. Good morning. Great to have you here. I love discussing all of all of the rich history that a lot of people aren't familiar with here in San Diego. What was your, your goal behind uh, some of the research that you've done on San Diego's black well, history. Yes, my goal is to, um, you know, f dig up the information and to preserve it and to share it. And um, I just think that it's very important that um, we um, highlight our ancestors and to bring out the legacy of those that came before us. And make sure mm -hmm. that some of these incredible stories don't get lost. Right. Uh, and, and some of our black history starts with you and your own mm. family. Your father has uh, two schools named after him in San Diego. Tell us a little bit about your father. Well, my dad um, was very active in the San Diego community and um, he was the NAACP president in the early 70s and had the largest membership during that time. My father was a dean of the San Diego Community College District at ECC and Mid City Center. And he did a lot of other things. I mean, it, it, I think at one time he served on like 19 different boards. Wow. And earlier in life, my father also um, was a ventriloquist and um, he opened up um, for jazz artists um, in Los Angeles and um, famous people like Red Fox and Ella Fitzgerald and whatnot. So he had a lot of that, um, you know, performance background too. So now we're seeing a, a picture of one of the the openings, mm. the unveiling of the name of the Walter J. Porter, your father, yes. uh, the elementary school, one of the campuses. Uh, tell us about this and the fact that uh, the schools are, were given his name. Right. Um, I believe it was in 2003, there was, um, I had started a campaign. Um, when my father had passed away, there were individuals that stated they thought that something should be named after him. So um, when I had found the opportunity, um, I did a campaign and um, had people within the community to um, write letters um, stating that they would like um, the schools named after him. And it happened. So it, it was exciting because, you know, it's a legacy that I can be proud of. And, um, and it was a way for me to honor my dad that we can all be proud of. And it was interesting reading some of the stories. I know um, that you've done some, some research mm -hmm. on the, the Robinsons of <sighs> Julian, Margaret and Albert Robinson. And uh, people may know they, they owned and operated the Robinson yes. Hotel, which was one of the first businesses in San Diego owned and operated by a black family. Yes, uh -huh. um, well, as a matter of fact, I played Maria who was the Native American um, with, um, you know, Chuck Ambers is um, a, a historian over at, um, you know, in Old Town. And so he usually plays like um, Fred Coleman and I was asked if I could play um, the wife of, um, of um, Fred Coleman. So, and, and so there was the Robinsons were right there, you know, and we, we, we were a part of the Julian Parade. So it was wonderful. Can you tell mm -hmm. us a little bit more about the picture that we were just showing? I don't know if you had oh. a chance to see it. Uh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Oh yeah. Well, you know what? The, um, I'm not remembering the gentleman's name, but he's very well known, and um, he he had businesses and whatnot. But he did a lot um, for the children in the community. That's fantastic. This is just part of some of a lot of the stories that are right. that are coming out that you've kept track of. And we have this yes. this large book <laughs> yes. on Nate Harrison, and this um, this actually a, a study, an excavation of mm -hmm. Nate Harrison's site or cabin uh, on Palomar Mountain was done by students at San Diego State University. Uh, he was a pioneer. Uh, with a rich history and a lot of people knew him. Can you tell us the history behind Nate Harrison? Right, okay, he came to um, San Diego, well actually to California in about 1848 and um, his owner, um, you know, wanted to be a part of the gold rush. And so um, Nate Harrison um, came along with him. And apparently, like when his owner passed away, um, he basically was free and the Native Americans took him in and um, gave him land. 
but um, since he was, um, you know, a very friendly guy, um, he would um, water the horses that would come up the hill. So anybody that would want to come through um, Palomar Mountain. To go up Palomar Mountain, mm -hmm. he was kind of the first friendly face right. that, they, that they would encounter. Right. Why, do, why was the excavation done uh, on that site? I, I mean, the, the pictures are so mm. detailed. I mean, the, oh, the, yeah. the stones and everything that he had created, it was all still pretty preserved. But why mm. was it such a focus uh, for... Well, uh, well I went um, to one of the excavational, um, the times when they were excavating, and they had a big event and whatnot. But what's important is that this gentleman um, was met by different people throughout the world, and so um, they wanted to find out more about him. His cabin is still there, but it's the rocks are just all over the grounds. And um, one of the ladies that owns the property wants to um, make a museum out of um, uh, about Nate Harrison. Some of the artifacts mm -hmm. that were With found the there. Uh -huh. what, what kind of artifacts were found there? Because I, mean, I know you right. mentioned that he would get gifts from people mm -hmm. all over the world. Mm -hmm. People would, would visit him when they were going up the mountain. So were there a lot of interesting artifacts that were found yeah, at there the were site? thousands, apparently, from what I'm hearing. I think like 54,000, maybe there may be more. But it could be buttons, um, maybe um, liquor, because he liked to drink. So they would, um, he would have, there were bottles in the ground. and. I think they even found some type of um, um, powder for a woman's face. You know, they had the little... A little compact. Yes, yes. yes. So <laughs> they were finding all kinds of things, right? Not not something that you would actually expect at an excavation mm -hmm. site uh, on right. Palomar Mountain. Right, and he also had, um, he was a farm herder, or uh, what is a sheep herder, mm -hmm. so they even found bones, you know, um, somewhere off, you know, on that land. And so, you know, you were able to really see what type of um, individual he was. So he worked, you know, so. So what is, what is the next project for you? Mm. <laughs> okay. Because I want to preserve the history, I have been going to the um, cemeteries. I've been pretty much at Mount Hope Cemetery, mm -hmm. and um, I've been looking at the pioneers of San Diego, and, um, and then some of them, so white and black. And some of the individuals that I have found, um, you know, like their resting places, there are no headstones. And it really makes me sad yeah. because um, these are individuals that, um, you know, forged, you know, this new area. I will belt it up and, and there's nothing to remember them by. Yeah. So I want to start a campaign, um, you know, getting some headstones. To continue that research and mm -hmm. get them the headstones that, right. that, that they deserve. So we certainly will follow along uh, in your reporting there and your progress and great work digging up some of the information that you mm -hmm. already have. It's certainly a pleasure to talk with you, Yvette. So continue to uh, keep in touch with us and let us know how that goes. I will. Thank, Thank you for you. being here this morning. Well, a new promenade honoring the life and legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. will be unveiled in Broadway Heights later this month. Here to talk about the project and how it will benefit the community is the president of the Broadway Heights Community Council, Robert Robinson, and treasurer Carla Crudup. Good morning to the both of you. Thank Good you morning. for being here. Thank well, for you. people who are not familiar with the council, can you tell us a little bit more about it? Well, the um, Broadway Heights Community Council, we've been in existence now for 41 years. Uh, we've taken on a number of projects. We've done a lot of things in our community. We have the lowest crime rate in all of the city of San Diego and have had for about 27 years, and that's documented by the San Diego Police Department. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. And Carla, this is a really an exciting unveiling uh, with this promenade. Tell us about uh, the project and how this all got started, because this is a long time in the making. Well, it started, I believe, about a decade ago. They started with the naming of the street to Martin Luther King. And this design and development of the pro promenade started several years back. And it came to fruition when they received the monies from the city to go ahead and proceed. And then we started 
actually last summer. So this what we're looking at is sort of the construction renderings of, yes. of how the prom. So so give us an idea because I know um, the highlight, if you will, is the the sculpture of of Dr. King, and it's done with 68 individually cut plates of stainless steel. And so Robert, these are all kind of melded together, and and will create the statue. They are well together, um, and they've. Uh finished them and made it where that they have the actual picture of Dr. King through a 3D process. Uh, it's uh, 31 inches high and it's 21 uh, inches wide. Uh, but the statue is just one aspect of this project. Uh, so what are some of the other highlights of, of the, the promenade? There's a lot of history um, that's going to be uh, depicted on the street there. Uh, where we're talking about the civil rights movement, we're talking about the continents, we are talking about historical folks throughout the world, uh, where that the kids can go there as a field trip with the education system. We have uh, URLs there where they can click on the URL and they can pull that history up. Uh, it's just a place where people will be able to go and do that. Then it's a place where the community can go and be a part of, and we want to make this a great historical site. Yeah, because this is, I mean, we have Black History Month to honor, remember, and sort of reflect on on the black history that we have, a tremendous amount of history, not just here in San Diego, which right. we've we've highlighted, but also uh, throughout the country. And, and this is a really, a more interactive approach. Yeah, the approach is to educate. We must continue to educate, and we're using this vehicle to continue to tell the story. Uh, it's very important that we continue to tell the story because the young people need to know the story, whether they want to go for it or not. But we want them to know that that history is there. We want everybody to know. This is an inclusive project. It's not an African-American project. And I believe that uh, African-American Month should be every day, 365 days a year, because that's just the way it is. It, uh, um, what we call as freedom was not established in one day. And Dr. King was about everybody and everybody matters. And it's about be building the beloved community. And that's what we really want to take place. We want to continue to grow on that. And we will make this project uh, a, a lot larger than it is. So what can we expect on the 23rd with, with the unveiling? Well. It's going to, you know, art is the beholder, the eye of the beholder, that's it. <laughs> yes. So that's, that remains to be seen, what people's thought process is. But we've spent a lot of time uh, trying to develop this bus so that it would depict Dr. King as closely as possible we could by operating with steel. Yeah. Carla, what does it mean to you to see uh, this come together and have it... Uh, all be unveiled on the 23rd in in this kind of big celebration. Oh, it's such a momentous event. I was raised in Broadway Heights. I've lived there since I was five years old. And I recently moved back about a year and a half ago to help my mom. And just to watch this, to be a part of a, it's a movement in itself because it's a, it's exemplary of the world coming together it's a place where people can be educated. We've even going to have um, some things in Braille. We want it to be a curriculum that's approved. And Dr. King, in his I Have a Dream speech, I think he knew that as a visionary there would be peaks and valleys. But as long as the slope is ascending, and I think that's what this will clearly illustrate, and unity and wholeness not just with our community, the city, the country, even the world. And Robert, being, being the president of, of the Broadway Heights Community Council and, and talking about how long it has been since you've tried to get this, this promenade uh, done and come together, personally, what does it mean to you that oh. uh, we're, we're basically here? <laughs> oh, oh it's, it's, it's one of the greatest feelings that I could have in our community could have to be able to have this in our community. And our hats is off to uh, Mayor Faulkner and Myrtle Cole for helping us get the money to make this project happen. The, the real thing about the 23rd is that it's gonna have a real celebration. 
We'll have a program, but we're going to celebrate throughout the day. We'll have a concert. We'll have jazz entertainment. We'll have R&B entertainment. We have some of the um, gentlemen that used to play with Earth, Wind & Fire in a band. He's going to be there in Peaches & Herb. They're going to be there. They're going to be the closing act. Uh, so people will bring their lawn chairs, their chairs, and they will sit, and we'll just celebrate, and we'll, we'll have food there for folks to eat. And we're actually going to uh, serve food that Dr. King uh, lacked. So we, we're, we're doing that. <laughs> okay, so this again is Saturday, February 23rd at 10 a.m., and you're yes. inviting everyone to, to come to the event and, and show up. This yes. is a citywide thing. We, 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 it's public, it's open to the public. Anybody want to come and partake, they can. All right, it is a celebration for all of us, and yes, it, it's it great to it see is. it. And uh, I asked for sneak peeks, but it's not happening. So the official unveiling is happening there mm -hmm. of, of the statue for That's correct. Dr. King. Thank you both so much for being here. Thank Robert you. Thank Appreciate you. It. Appreciate it. Well, when we talk about black history, it is important to acknowledge the role that music plays. So here to talk more about the significance of music in black history is Ken Anderson and Dale Fleming from the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir. You two are too much fun. I am really looking forward to this. <laughs> Um, but we're, we're talking about the, the important role that music has in black history. And uh, Ken, uh, we've, we've had you on our morning show many times with uh, the, the talents of your choir as well. You're the director. Talk about, uh, for you personally, what, what the role music played in, in black history in general. Well, in black history, the, um, going back to the fields of the South, the music facilitated the efforts of the Underground Railroad as they sang code songs. Leaders in the Bible, especially Moses, were code names for Harriet Tubman and others like her. The Jordan River and the Mississippi, Ohio, uh, the J Jordan River was a code name for the Mississippi and the Ohio Rivers and freedom and, and uh, was the code name for freedom was like heaven, promised land, home. So when they were singing these songs from stories they took from the Bible, they were actually communicating this is when and where and how we're going to get away. And the owners didn't realize that the songs carried a double meaning for them. Yeah, and also a message of hope. Certainly. Uh, but, you know, that's the one thing that will keep you going if things are rough, if there's the possibility of getting out. And so with the, uh, with the Underground Railroad and their efforts to get slaves away, uh, singing these songs, they would keep each other encouraged. Certainly they helped with the work day as well, the rhythm of the work and all of that, and then a little encouragement around you. Needed a lot of encouragement in a hard time like that. And Dale, you have been singing with Ken uh, for what, 20 years? Over 20 years, well, a we long each other time. time. <laughs> she knew who she was before she knew who I was. <laughs> Used to see her with her choir at her church. And, and oh, that sounds you, like a you story. Can't miss in her with that soprano voice. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're looking forward to, to hearing from the both of you. But um, first, I'll ask you, Dale, what, what does it mean to you to, to take part in the Martin Luther King Jr. Community Choir and, and all the wonderful events that, that you all get to sing? Well, it really feeds my soul. We've created a, a community of people that are different colors, shapes, sizes, ages, <laughs> backgrounds, faiths. Some have no faith, but we're all in this community working together. It's the best volunteer experience you could ever have, and we're working to earn funds to give uh, scholarships to kids that are graduating in the creative and performing arts. And then on top of that, the music really feeds my soul, so I love it. We're looking at some video of the choir singing there. Ken, how did the choir come about? How did it start? Well, originally, it is traditional in the cities at the time of Martin Luther King to have what they call a commemorative choir. It's usually an alliance of ministers from different denominational backgrounds that come together and have this program where the, there will be a choir that sings, they give a concert, and then the monies that are raised, they give scholarships with that money. And the year that I was the guest preparer, is that the way I would put it? I, I didn't come to direct the choir, but I came to prepare the choir for the guest director. Uh, some members of the choir expressed an interest in becoming a choir because they only got together for that part of the year. But it was a big thing back then with SDG and E, the San Diego Symphony, and so we formed a we formed a choir and uh, with a season from September to uh, to June and uh, and how a many one three C and how many members are average around one hundred uh, I'd say that we go out and average somewhere between sixty and eighty people singing at a time when we take out 
a large number of us, every once in a while we can get full to everybody out. <laughs> we have like 35 or so performances a year, so people do what fits their schedule. Been to Europe, seven, Dale, seven yeah. Seven countries in Europe. Yeah. Seven, uh, Seven countries. Yeah, I think seven countries in Europe. That's Been to fantastic. New York a couple of times. Um, Carnegie Hall and just came um, back for the nation's capital. So it's been really, um, a really again, it's it's just a double bang for the buck because you're doing something for others and yet you get so much out of the experience. And the music, it's historical. It's part of our American culture, and it's great to be able to share that with other nations and with our own country and was, our own community. I was going to ask you about the repertoire of, of music that you have that you perform. If there is is a guide to that and how you choose uh, the music. Not that really. Will... Sometimes people ask for a certain song. Or I try to do across the board some old, some new. What fits our group, and of course, a lot of the Negro spirituals, mm -hmm. and sometimes anthems. But like. Like when we were in D.C., we were at the museums, the Bible Museum and the African American Museum, the national capital, at the nation's capital and Lincoln Memorial, but at the Dr. King's statue. We actually got to sing at the foot of the statue and we sang We Shall Overcome, his signature oh. song for the movement that he led. And it's got goosebumps. So that must yeah. have been we get a little bit of everything. But there's also a, a big program that's done during the year, too. It's called All About the Blues. And uh, in that, we kind of trace the history of African American music from the spiritual through the rag, swing, jazz, blues. So they, that, and that thing, there are performances by all of the artists out of the gospel choir. Out of, out of the choir comes all of the singers for Aretha or Michael Jackson or <laughs> whatever, as we just trace the history of the music because all of the music, all of the popular styles are rooted in the Negro spiritual, including gospel, which is the only one that incorporates all of the others. And so before we run out of time, we uh, <laughs> save the best for last. So what will you be performing for us? We're going to now? sing, um, uh, Ain't Got Time to Die. Keep so busy, praising my Jesus, Ain't Got Time to Die. Okay, take it away. Looking forward to it. So, uh, Lord, keep so busy praising my Jesus. Keep so busy praising my Jesus. Keep so busy praising my Jesus. Ain't got time to die when I'm feeding the poor. When I'm feeding the poor. When I'm feeding the poor. Lord, I ain't got time to die. Cause it takes all my time to praise my Jesus. All my time. Praise my Lord, if I don't praise him, the rock's going to cry out. Glory and honor, glory and honor, ain't got time to die, Lord. I keep so busy working for the kingdom. Keep so busy working for the kingdom. Keep so busy working for the kingdom. Ain't got time to die when I'm healing the sick. When I'm healing the sick. When I'm healing the sick. Lord, I ain't got time to die. Cause it takes all of my time to praise my Jesus. All of my time to praise my Lord. I don't praise him. The rock's gonna cry out. Glory and honor, glory and honor. Ain't got time to die, Lord. I keep so busy serving my master. Keep so busy serving my master. Keep so busy serving my master. Ain't got time to die when I'm giving my all. When I'm giving my all. When I'm giving my all. Lord, I ain't got time to die. Cause it takes all of my time to praise my Jesus. All of my time to praise my Lord. I don't praise him. The rock's gonna cry out. Glory and honor, glory and honor. Ain't got time to die. Now won't you get out of my way? Let me praise my Jesus. Out of my way, let me praise my Lord. I don't praise him. The rock's gonna cry out. Glory and honor. 